Our first presentation this morning is from uh, Jessie Weir. She's uh, just completed a PhD program, uh, University of Florida, or sorry, University of Florida and University of Delaware program. Uh, at the same token, she is looking for a job, <laughs> so <laughs> wanted to put in a plug for her. Um, with that, I'll let Jessie introduce herself and, and provide her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cordes, for that um, nice introduction. <clears throat> so today I'll be talking to, you to, talking to you guys about a little bit of what my dissertation work was, which was evaluating the impact of ammonia emissions from equine operations on the environment. So we know in the last recent years, um, the US EPA has come out and said that about 82% of ammonia emissions are related to agriculture, with about 54% of those emotion, uh, emissions being from animal agriculture. And um, in 2014, they had this nice, um, partitioning of the f different livestock um, systems. And you know we have our typical, our beef, dairy, um, poultry, and swine contributing the most, but then there's this 2% that is horses. And you know my question when I saw this was, you know, is that accurate, is that close to what's going on? So what we do know from horses, in 2016 there was a nice comprehensive study um, done showing the uh, um, you know, nitrogen or impact on equine operations. And they nicely gave me a nice table to show that um, this is all the work that's been done looking at ammonia gas in a concentration form. And nobody in the horse industry has taken it the next step and calculated what the emissions rate would be. So why do we even consider ammonia to be an issue in the horse industry? Well, it's very, very common for <coughs> horse owners to overfeed crude protein. And we know that, we know that crude protein um, is directly related to the dietary crude protein Crude protein intake is directly related to the amount of nitrogen in the urine, and that can then vol volatilize into ammonia. Um, also, uh, one of the reasons why it might be difficult and um, for why horse owners overfeed protein is because it's difficult for them to balance their horse's diet. So that leads us into our first one, which is characterizing ammonia emissions from horse fed, um, horses fed different crude protein concentrations. And the objective here was to determine the effects of dietary crude protein concentration and fetting type on potential ammonia losses from feces and urine of horses fed an all forage diet. So in this study, we uh, used a three by three replicated Latin square and used nine geldings, which were castrated male horses, um, and fed them three diets consisting of two warm season grass hays and then a vitamin mineral supplement just to make sure everything else was balanced. And I thought it was really important to keep protein quality similar, so that's why I chose these two warm season grass hays. I didn't want to change that quality too much. Um, so then this was conducted over three periods so that all horses received all diets. Um, and so we had an 11-day diet adaptation and three-day total collection of um, urine and feces. And we use these nice, um, what we call nappies. Um, so feces and urine are never in contact with each other. So for diet composition, we, um, the haze that we used was a Bahia grass hay and Tifton 85. And so as we increased our diet, so we had a low, medium, and high crude protein diet, we increased the amount of Tifton 85. So for the daily nutrient intake, we can see that um, you know, crude protein increased as the diets did, and so did dry matter intake. That was because these hays were so low in crude protein that it had to increase how much they were eating just to get the um, crude protein different among diets. So when we talk about what they were getting in their diets, my goal was to meet them at 100% of their um, nutrient requirement. Um, and that is really hard to see, as we can see here. So the nutrient, or the NRC requirement for crude protein for a mature horse of this size is 712 grams per day. And my low diet was still above, so it was at 110, and then my medium was at 130 and 150. So we're not even talking about a wide range here. You know, a lot of horse owners are overfeeding crude protein by almost 200% of the NRC requirement. So then these urine and feces were separated in two different batches. 5% was frozen at um, minus 20, and that was composited by horse, and that's where we did our dry matter, our total nitrogen, and urea. And then 5% was sent to um, Dr. Hong Lee at University of Delaware, and these were composited by diet, and this is what we use for the in vitro ammonia chamber system. So this in vitro uh, ammonia chamber system consists of 12 vessels, and samples were urine and feces samples were mixed with straw or shavings separately. So in each um, 
bucket, there was um, a urine, either urine or feces mixed with straw or shavings. Um, and so this system <coughs> ran so that sequentially, so that um, e in each bucket, it, was, it ran for five minutes, it was collected for five minutes, um, for 65 minutes. And then inside these buckets, there is a little mixing fan, and so that would mix the headspace to get the ammonia that would go up in the exhaust air, and the ammonia would be measured by this multi-gas photoacoustic analyzer to get our ammonia concentration from the samples. From there, we went to calculate the emissions rate based on some parameters, and these were all fixed, and we could control these, which makes it a much easier. So first, um, some of our manure nitrogen char characteristics. Our fecal nitrogen um, was different in our medium and high diet versus our low diet, but more interestingly, our urinary nitrogen did increase as the crude protein increased. And same thing with urea. And then what I find, um, what I think is the most important is this, um, the urea nitrogen as a percent of urine nitrogen, because that's what's susceptible to a loss as ammonia. That also increased from about 70 to almost 100% of the urine nitrogen was urea nitrogen. So in feces, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my axis quickly. So this is our time in the vessel system. We did this chamber system over seven days. Um, and then on our y-axis, we have the ammonia cumulative emissions in milligrams. <coughs> so I think that's important to point out because feces did not contribute much at all. While we're seeing differences by day, diet, and period, um, there was not much contribution from the feces, which is what we would expect. So in urine, um, just to point out on the y-axis, we do have it in grams per day. So that's why you're seeing this difference. And um, when just looking at the, sh the um, shavings here, um, we can see that there, it starts to increase after about day three. We think that's when your urea hydrolysis began. And that there was um, a trend for a difference in diet, not quite a difference in diet, which I'll talk about in a minute. So then when you add in the uh, bedding types, we can see that bedding was more, or the straw was higher um, in ammonia emissions than it was from the shavings. So what does this tell us? You know, overfeeding crude protein uh, leads to this increase in urinary nitrogen and urea nitrogen, which then can be susceptible to loss. The reason we think we didn't see any differences between diets um, was because of this narrow range of crude protein intake. So um, we, we, we think that might be why. Um, and then the um, emissions was higher from when mixed with wheat straw compared to wood shavings. And then this largest increase, again, came uh, from day three to five, and we think that's when a urea hydrolysis was started. So that was great, because you know, it was a nice in the lab situation, but then we were interested to see, okay, well, can we figure out what the ammonia emissions are on farm? So we went to the mid-Atlantic region, and I wanted to determine the air emissions from four equine operations as affected by housing type and management pr feeding practices. So first, we had to find the farms, um, and we were very, very fortunate to make some good um, um, collaborations while we were at the University of Delaware and I was able to get to four different very different type facilities but all fairly large I wouldn't say large medium-sized equine operations and we we, we um, talked with the barn managers and collected a lot of characteristics about daily practices and barn characteristics so at farm a um, it was a university riding stable and farm a and b both were on wood shavings and I was fortunate at farm a they let me come out twice a day because these were working facilities so I had to work around their schedule um, and come out two times a day so I was able to get um, what I think is really important when was the last time the stall was clean so in the morning it was clean 24 hours ago in the evening it was cl clean six hours ago so farm b was a breeding facility and they only clean their stalls once a day Farm C um, they was a working resource facility, so they clean their stalls at 3.30 in the morning and told me I'm not allowed to come in until the horses are in training. So when I did it about approximately six hours after stalls were clean, and these horses were standing um, basically on the mats and all the straw was pulled up to the side before they went out to exercise. And lastly was a large breeding operation, and they bedded on wheat straw. So then I took body weights of all the horses I took these ammonia measurements from, and I sampled their hay and concentrate to estimate daily crude protein intake. And we can see that um, if you look down here, what I think is the most interesting is looking at this percent over the NRC requirement. They're all over, and you know they're higher than I got in my study, in my controlled study. So this farm D was feeding um, to over 200%. They fed alfalfa. <laughs> the other three did not feed alfalfa, so that could be a lot as to why. 
so how I did my ammonia measurement. So I used a dynamic flux chamber system. And um, seen here, you just put this, what I call the giant salad bowl, over an area. And, it and there's a mixing fan, and it measures the ammonia concentration in that area. And because I wanted to get a representative um, sample of the entire stall, I took five different sampling points. So then from that concentration, we did the same thing. We used the same equation, but some of our parameters are different, like our area under the, the measurement was different. Um, the volume or was um, higher. And then um, what's really important is this weighted concentration. So horses do not, you know, there's this little bit of balance of how much of the stall is covered with urine, which is where most of the urine ammonia is going to come from, um, and how much is from the dry area. So we set that 30% of the stall was wet and 60% or 70% was dry. So first, if we look at um, on our x-axis, we have our percent of daily crude protein intake over the requirement. Um, and we looked at the correlation of that with the ammonia concentration. And we can see that there is a fairly nice relationship as you increase your you go over that NRC requirement, you are going to increase the ammonia concentrations coming from the wet <coughs> areas of the stall. Next, we looked at um, daily emissions over three days, so at each facility, I was there for three days. And these first three were the 24 um, hours post clean, or since the stalls have been clean, and this is the six hours, so that's what's showing these differences. Um, and I think that's a really important part. You know, like we clean, it depends on the, the management practices, but normally we clean stalls at least once a day in horse operations, um, but maybe doing it more often might be a good thing. Um, another interesting thing to point out is that they, this barn was on straw, so we already know it's probably gonna be higher from the straw, and they were feeding the most protein. So that's what I'm thinking is going on here with this facility. So just like, you know, my next question was, so okay, how do we compare to the other species, you know, the other li large um, livestock species? And two nice um, comprehensive studies were done um, by other groups of feedlot cattle and dairy cows. And you can see that our range was 18.5 to 124 grams per day of ammonia. And we're right there with them, maybe a little bit lower. And what's, you know, factoring in these different influences? Well, one thing that isn't on here is, you know, we were doing point sampling. I wasn't looking at it over a day, I wasn't looking at it over a season, it was just one, it was over a two week period in October, um, so I was just getting a point sample. Um, other things could be facility type, bedding type, and dietary crude protein, we can say have an influence on this. The proportion of dietary nutri or nitrogen retained is definitely going to play a role. Um, and then management practices. I know like in the horse industry, some people clean stalls better than others, you know, and they don't get all that wet up, and the wet is what's gonna cause the problem. So some conclusions are that ammonia emissions estimated from these four operations range from the 18.5 to 124 grams um, per horse per day. And the EPA right now, their emission gap for four horses for ammonia is um, 26.9 pounds <coughs> per year per horse. Um, and if we use the, the, the results I got from the current study, we were a little bit lower than that. Um, again, I, th I think there's a lot of things I could do with that. Maybe it is lower, but I think there needs to be more research done um, before we can say anything more about that. Um, re reducing crude protein intake sounds like the most feasible way to do it. It's very difficult to do that in the horse industry. Um, I mean, that 712 grams a day is very low for a mature maintenance horse. Most hays are gonna be, or grasses are gonna hit that, you know, just to meet their dry matter intake. So we need to think of some other ways to get this ammonia down and, um, you know, to mitigate it. But these relative emissions definitely give a good, a better understanding of the impact these equine operations have on the environment. And with that, I'll take any questions. We have uh, five minutes. separate buckets. I did not mix them. Just curious, we, we did, without the bedding, dairy, feces, dairy, urine, mm -hmm. separate containers, and there was no ammonia emissions to mix them. And we have the urea yeah. with the ureas. So can you maybe talk through how you... Yeah, so I'm thinking maybe a little bit of what was going on is maybe there's some urease in the activity of the actual bedding substrate um, is what we think is going on. But the next step would definitely be to mix them together and then see what happens.
because that's more a more realistic, you know, what's going to happen in the field. Uh, in the barn experiment, you talked about uh, a difference between the wet and dry areas mm -hmm. and compensating for that in the emission. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so could you measure a difference between wet and dry areas, and if so, what was that built? Uh, you mean, like, well, how did I decide? Yeah, uh, okay. describe that wet <coughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, you look at a horse stall and you can kind of tell where the wet areas and the dry areas are. We did attempt to do some thermal imaging to calculate exactly how much was wet and how much was dry. Um, we probably need to look at that a little bit more before I think it would be robust. So we mostly just estimated, and I said that anything that was dry, if I took from a dry sample or an area that was dry, it was under 50 parts per million, and it was if it was over, I called it being wet, like truly wet. In, in the laboratory, you went for several days for mm -hmm. the test. Mm -hmm. And then what about, compare that to how stalls are cleaned. Uh, yeah. You said they're generally cleaned up daily. Yes. For both feces and urine? Um, yeah, for them, I would say most places do, they pick stalls out throughout the day at a lot of operations, but that means picking up the feces. Right. The urine, um, I think it's a little bit more varied. I would say most good barns clean it out once a day, but probably no more than that. Um, they may leave it for a couple days or there's wet bedding left over. But um, even if it's removed, it's still somewhere on the farm emitting ammonia somewhere. So that's kind of what the justification was behind the seven days. When we work with farmers out in the field, my farmers in the field, it's very common for us to recommend that they pick the hill. chamber system is fantastic. Um, I think we need to do some brainstorming what else we can do because our problem is, is we have these walls up in between each horse, you know, so we can't do some of the other cool stuff I've seen that they've done in open feedlots and things. But I would uh, expand it out to more farms and maybe, you know, to get a better idea there. In more regions, I would do like, you know, I do them over different seasons, um, at different times of the day, everything like that. So I took all that into account. I classified each of the horses in the operations because I was lucky that the ones I picked were all very similar. Um, so I did, I, ca I calculated them for being in hard, intense work and they were still over about, about 149% for their crude protein requirement. And then those brood mares are number, uh, for farm D, those were brood mares, but I think they were in like six months of gestation. Um, they just, you know, I went to the barn and they're like, you know, that's the other hard thing working with producers, right? You ask, oh, how much hay do you feed? I don't know about this much. It doesn't really help. <laughs> but you know, they're like, oh, we always feed alfalfa all the time. And you walked in that barn and it hit you. I mean, maybe not if you're used to walking to a poultry house, but you know, like if, if you're just going into barns, there was a major difference in that barn. It had lower ceilings as well. It wasn't as well ventilated as, like that racehorse barn was big and beautiful. I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna see anything. <laughs> Do you think the amount of disturbance of, of the bedding, you know, that, that, that determines how much ammonia is released? You know, I know work mostly with uh, the horses with uh, race tracks, mm -hmm. and you know they, they clean out the stalls and they put all, all, all the, the water in big dumpsters, mm -hmm. and it kind of like sits there for a while, there. and then they move the dumpsters to this, this collection area right. where they. they
then another step is definitely going to the whole farm. So let's figure out what's going on in every part of the farm. So then we have these horses that go out for or live outside, and obviously it's not affecting them, but there's still maybe something. Any last questions? If not, please help me thank Jesse.